Good evening, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's talk. Dr. Kim Heikela is our speaker. She's going to talk. Her speech is about to bear the mark, unwed motherhood at the Salvation Army's Booth Memorial Hospital, 1913 to 1973, or my mother and me. My name's John Lindley. I'm the editor of Ramsey County History, which is the quarterly history publication of the Ramsey County Historical Society. And the Ramsey County Historical Society is sponsoring this talk. Dr. Kim Heikela has a PhD in American Studies with a minor in Feminist Studies from the University of Minnesota. She has written about Booth Memorial Hospital for Ramsey County history and Minnesota history. This is our magazine, and her article is featured on the cover. Her second article is here in Minnesota history. It's buried inside. <laughs> Shows you I knew what I was doing. <laughs> um, and she has published several personal essays about her mother's experiences as a birth mother and her own as an adoptive mother. She recently completed an oral history project with former Booth residents, staff, and related personnel, which was sponsored by the Minnesota Independent Scholars Forum with funding from a Minnesota Historical and Cultural <laughs> Heritage Grant. Her first book, Sisterhood of War, Minnesota Women in Vietnam, published by the Minnesota Historical Society Press in 2011, was a finalist for a 2012 Minnesota Book Award. She taught U.S. and women's history at local colleges and universities for more than 10 years before leaving academia to open her own oral history consulting business Spotlight Oral History. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask that you please welcome Dr. Kim Heikela. Pardon me. Thank you, John, for that introduction and for um, inviting me here to speak to all of you tonight. I'm really thrilled to be here and I'm thrilled to see such a good crowd. So thank all of you for coming out as well. And thanks to Judy Woodward, who is part of the library staff here, um, and Robin Priestley as well from the Historical Society for helping make all the logistics of this talk work. Um, and for Judy Woodward also published a really nice article about the project in the Highland Villager just recently. So thanks to all of them as well. <clears throat> I have to apologize in advance. You might hear a little frog in my throat. I'm sure it's because um, just, I don't know, a couple weeks ago I was talking to somebody and kind of <laughs> bragging about the fact that I hadn't gotten sick <laughs> all season. And now I am, a little bit. So I have a little bit of a cough, so I may have to take an occasional sip of water, or if things really turn desperate, I might have to pull out a lifesaver. So just so you know, apologies in advance, but I will soldier on and do my best. <clears throat> okay. So this is a photo of me and my mother sometime in the late summer or maybe early fall of 1968. I had been born on Mother's Day of that year. My birth was met with all the attendant joy of any first child's arrival, augmented, of course, by the auspicious timing. How lovely and amazing, friends and family told my mother, that you became a mother, a first-time mother, on Mother's Day. And when my brother was born two years later in 1970, I'm sure it was just old hat by then, not quite such a celebration. When I first saw this photo after my mother died in 2009, I thought it was a lovely image of a doting mother gazing in wonder at her cherished baby. It may be that partly, but if I look more closely at the photo, I see more complicated emotions in my mother's face. For 26 years, I lived with the notion that I had indeed been my mother's first child, the elder of two. Then, over a nervous dinner at the Ground Round in Crystal in the early summer of 1994, 
My mother broke the news. There had been another baby, a daughter, who was born in 1961 and given up for adoption. And I use that language very intentionally. I know it's not kind of adoption friendly language. As an adoptive mother, I know that. But I use it very intentionally for reasons that may become apparent as we, as we go through here. So my mother had gotten pregnant as a single college student in the spring of 1960. And with no support from the father and in fear of shame and disappointment from her family and friends, she finished that spring term at the university, then boarded a Greyhound bus for California with the intention of starting life anew with her baby. She was going to raise that baby. After a harrowing bus ride cross-country while she had morning sickness, however, and a few lonely days in San Francisco, she decided she'd be better off facing the uncertain future in a familiar environment. So she turned around and came back home to Minnesota, feebly suggesting to her parents, who didn't know anything of what was going on, that California just hadn't worked out. Now, by the time she had worked up the courage, out of necessity, really, because she was starting to show, to tell her mother and father, my grandparents, that she was pregnant, her mother was already in the know. My grandmother had intercepted a letter addressed to my mother from Booth Memorial Hospital. Somehow my mom had found out about Booth and made some kind of initial inquiry, and they responded to her with a letter to her home address, which she was sharing with her parents, and my grandmother found the letter. So my grandmother already knew. Um, and she had just been waiting for my mom to, to fess up. And she made my mother tell my grandfather the news. My mother was the apple of my grandfather's eye, and he did not receive this news well. He was quite upset. And this is by her own accounting many years later. Um, he got over it, she said, but it was not easy news to hear. And so <clears throat> in mid-century America, of course, a daughter's moral transgression reflected poorly on the whole family, especially her own mother. So we can talk about that in a little bit. So for the next several months, my mother lived in the bedroom under the eaves of my grandparents' one and a half story house in Spring Lake Park a home she shared with her four younger siblings. Her older brother had moved out of the house already. And an uncomfortable veil of silence about that pregnancy descended in that house, the open secret that nobody talked about. My mother didn't leave that house except one time in November of 1960 to get my grandmother a birthday gift. She took the bus downtown Minneapolis and went to Dayton's, I think, got a, a gift for my grandmother, brought it home, had a, had a little celebration. Unfortunately, that breach of the silence that you know, was supposed to surround this experience jolted my grandmother more than the gift moved her. So in January of 1961, just after the new year, my grandmother escorted my mother to Booth Memorial Hospital on Como Avenue in St. Paul, which I just drove by on my way here, and left her there to wait out the last couple weeks of her pregnancy. My sister was born on January 16th. My grandmother visited her daughter and granddaughter once at Booth, reporting back to my young aunts and uncles only that Sharon had a beautiful baby girl. That was the only time my grandmother would see that little girl. When my mother left Booth later that month, she came home empty-armed, ready, supposedly, to start life anew, slate wiped clean. Now, my mother married my father. My father is not the father of my sister. Uh, my mother and father got married in 1963, and my mother told my father about this, and together, for the next 33 years, they kept that secret. They did not talk about it to anybody. Nobody in my mother's family talked about this. It was a very tight veil of the silence that descended over this whole experience. Until one day in 1994, my mother received a call from a woman who wanted to talk to her about Lynette. Lynette was the name my mother had given that baby in 1961. Lynette was now named Kim. <laughs> so yes, indeed, I do have a sister named Kim. My brother has two sisters <laughs> named Kim. <laughs> There's a lot of Bob Newhart, Daryl, and my other brother Daryl jokes in there. Um, uh, and of course, her adoptive parents named her Kim. So Kim had finally found my mother, her birth mother, and two half-siblings she had never known. Kim visited my family in the summer of 1994, bringing full circle a story that had begun in a moment of passion in the spring of 1960. For the last 15 years of my mother's life, all three of her children were part of it. Added to that smallish family were two grandsons, 
Kim's son Christopher, who you see in the middle photograph here, was born in February of 1995, and my husband and I adopted our son, named Tu, from Vietnam in 2006. My mother, who had never been, as she would say of herself, a baby person, became a doting, loving grandmother to my son. She stocked her house with toys and sippy cups and booster seats and animal crackers. She brought my son to the beach and to the pool and to museums. She took him to his first movie, which was Elvin and the Chipmunks, <laughs> and somewhat to my horror at the time, gave him his first taste of Diet Coke <laughs> at said movie, and he was you know, two years old and coming home really <laughs> energetic. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Um, she entertained him, that child, with love and patience and spelled me from the stresses of new motherhood. She would likely have been this kind of grandmother to any child brought into the family, but I have to think there was something special for her in having the chance to know and love another mother's lost child. Then in, Sept in September 2008, my mom was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. The doctors gave her six months. And on February 9, 2009, five months later, she died at her home at 12.14 a.m with me and my brother at her side. Two, my son, was three and a half years old at the time. Now, adjusting to life without my mother was, of course, painful. But as happens, the force of life presses on, turning one day, one month, one year into the next. I was busy teaching and raising a son and working on another book project. When that book project was done, and as I continued to face my own shortcomings as a mother, I started wondering if and how my mother's first experience with motherhood the one that was filled with shame, the one that resulted in the loss of her first child, may have affected her parenting of me. I started wondering what it must have been like for her during those months of her first pregnancy, during those weeks at Booth, during the days and months and years she kept her secret. And I was brought up short by the fact that I, who was a historian of women in the United States in the post-World War II period, and an oral historian to boot, who learns about the past by asking people about their experiences, had not asked my mother any of these questions. We had been so focused on Kim's arrival in the present and then the subsequent dailiness of living that I missed the opportunity to really listen to my mother's story. And then she was gone. So a few years after my mother's death and a year after my other book came out, I decided my next project would focus on trying to unearth my mother's story in her absence. So I studied the history of Booth Memorial Hospital. I dug through files at the Minnesota Historical Society and at the Salvation Army National Archives in Alexandria, Virginia, courtesy of a legacy grant to the Minnesota Independent Scholars Forum. Pardon me just a moment. I pored over records at the University of Minnesota, thanks to the Summer Scholars Program at St. Catherine University, where I was teaching at the time, and the student at the time who worked with me on that, on that project that summer in 2015 is here tonight, Amanda Campbell. Thank you. And then last year, courtesy of a second legacy grant to the Minnesota Independent Scholars Forum, I was able to conduct oral history interviews with seven former Booth girls, a woman who had worked as a labor and delivery nurse at Booth for six years, five years, excuse me, and a Ramsey County caseworker whose caseload consisted of young women who were living at Booth from 1960 to 1962. So if I couldn't ask my mother directly, I did my best to amass as many other resources as possible to try to understand her experiences. So my goal tonight is to share with you the results of that research. And as I go and do that, I will weave my mother's story in um, as we go. Okay. Okay. So, Booth's story begins with the Salvation Army, an organization that we probably all are familiar with, with the red kettlebell at Christmas time. Um, it was an organization that started in London in 1865 and really combined street theater and public charity work with religious proselytizing to try to bring the masses to Christianity. One of its programs, among the many that it had, was to help, quote, fallen women. The poor, the homeless, the addicted, the prostitute, the sexually deviant, and the unwed mother. The Army opened its first rescue home for fallen women in London in 1884, and its first in the United States in New York City in 1886. The Army viewed these women as victims, 
who, if given the opportunity, would choose to live a more wholesome life. Salvation Army lassies would visit brothels and saloons. They would get out there in the streets with their male counterparts who were doing other things and patrol the streets in search of women in need of such an opportunity and bring them into these rescue homes and try to, by their example of good, clean living and loving maternal care that perhaps these women had not received, would help these women restore themselves. Now, the Army <clears throat> excuse me, had extended its work with women in need to Minnesota by 1898 when it opened a rescue home in St. Paul at University Avenue and Jackson Street, and that's what we see here. It's not a great photograph. It's taken from microfilm of an old newspaper, so it's really hard to see. But that was um, the original Salvation Army rescue home. A 1901 article about the rescue home that appeared in the St. Paul Globe said that the function of the home was, quote, to rebuild and reconstruct into its lost shape and pattern the torn and mangled fabrics of ruined lives of girls. So a little purple, a little purple in the prose. Nevertheless, that's, that's what the goal was. Now, as the years went on and prostitutes assumed the status of criminals rather than victims, unwed mothers provided the army with a sympathetic subject for their program of personal and social salvation. Still considered victims of male malfeasance, single mothers and mothers-to-be were viewed as ruined but redeemable, more sympathetic than the hardened, supposedly disease-carrying predatory professionals. In the early years of the rescue homes, in fact, and this is what the arrow is pointing to here, mothers were encouraged to keep their babies in hopes that that maternal bond, that act of nurturing a human being, a little child, would cement their transformation into proper women. So as part of their path to redemption was to keep their babies. By 1912, the needs of fallen women and unwed mothers had outgrown the space of the Salvation Army Rescue Home, now located on North Street. The 1912 annual report noted that the home had tended to 292 persons, 160 of whom were women, 132 of whom were children. By mid-1912 then, planning for a new home to be built on Como Avenue in St. Paul was underway. Adjutant True Earl spearheaded the campaign, soliciting and getting support from prominent Minnesota businessmen and civic leaders, including William and Joseph Elsinger of the Golden Rule Department Store in downtown St. Paul, and state architect Clarence Johnston. And there's a whole other interesting story in, in that history itself, but I'll refer you to the Ramsey County History Magazine, because it's all in there. I won't go into it here. The new Salvation Army Rescue Home opened to great fanfare on October 29, 1913. Local dignitaries and Salvation Army officers spoke to the crowd before offering a tour of the facility, which had accommodations for 45 adults, 30 infants, and 13 staff members. On an October 30th report by the St. Paul Pioneer Press, quoted Salvation Army Commissioner Anna Estill, who offered the dedication address, and who described the Army as a non-sectarian movement. Our work is to lift fallen girls out of the mire and into morality. So for the next 60 years, through changes in state and municipal regulations, obstetrical care practices, social work and psychology, and cultural mores, the Salvation Army attempted to do just that. Now, in the 1920s, the mission, of the, the mission of the Maternity and Rescue Home remained what it had been from the beginning, to restore its charges to healthful living and retain the mother-child bond. The Salvation Army never separates mother and child, Brigadier Annie Cowden told the Minneapolis Morning Tribune in January 1921. Following the baby's birth, the mother remains at home for three months or until she is able to go out and earn her own living and care for her child. During this period, she learns to love her baby and has no desire to give it up. Now, that three-month residency requirement wasn't merely Army policy, even if it supported their goal of kind of keeping custody of these women for as long as possible so they could, um, you know, impose their good influence on them. But as of 1918, the state of Minnesota had mandated that no maternity hospital could admit an unmarried pregnant woman unless she agreed to nurse her baby in residence for three months thereafter. It was a somewhat controversial measure, um, but those who supported it, one of the reasons they supported it, there were several, but one of them 
was that so it would prevent illegitimacy from becoming too easy. So in some ways, that some of these um, professionals, some of these people who are working with this population thought that, you know, there's also an element of um, punishment. You know, you got pregnant, you keep your child. Face and music, you raise it because you got yourself into this. But I think the Salvation Army and certainly um, Brigadier Cowden didn't have that particular attitude. She really had a much more nurturing attitude and really thought that this mother-child bond was an important thing to retain in its own right. Um, and the reason I bring this up, this three-month residency requirement at all, really, is to show that operations within the maternity home were not under the sole control of the Salvation Army. So by this time, county, state, and national regulations mandated certain kinds of treatment, while prevailing sentiment among public health, obstetrical, and social work experts also helped shape the contours of programming within Booth. By the 1940s, social workers in particular were playing a really prominent role in the operation of maternity homes across the country. And I should clarify that the Salvation Army was not the only organization that operated these maternity homes. There were many other, often faith-based organizations, um, Jewish Family Services, Catholic Relief Services, the Lutheran Social Service, the Florence Crittenden Association ran these kinds of maternity homes for unwed mothers in networks across the country. In the early decades of the 20th century, social workers had adopted the language and lens of scientific study to try to address social ills, such as poverty, housing, child labor, and substandard education. They also turned their attention to these rescue homes, and maternity homes, that were opened, operated, and staffed largely by evangelical women. So there was some amount of um, struggle for control over what was happening in these homes and with these women between the women who came from a spiritual approach to solving the problem and these social workers who were coming in with this kind of um, educated, scientific approach stemming from the progressive era to fix social problems. Now, the social worker's goal was to wield their expertise in helping individual women properly adjust to society's mores, as much to protect society from their corrupting influence sometimes as the reverse. Less concerned with unmarried mothers' spiritual salvation than their individual psychological function and place in the social fabric, social workers brought a casework treatment approach to the social ill of illegitimacy. This meant that the unmarried mother was to receive individualized counseling to help her understand and cope with her, per, with her proclivity towards sexual delinquency, in the most benign case, or in the most extreme case, to forcible sterilization of young women whose, quote, feeble-mindedness led to their pregnancy and, if left unchecked, would lead to the downgrading of the race. You have to think about the eugenics context here as well. And so the Sox Center Homeschool for Girls in the 20s, and I think even into the 30s, was a place where some of these feeble-minded young women were sent to be sterilized. Oftentimes, what, what constituted the grounds for that diagnosis for these young women to be feeble-minded wasn't so much any kind of literal mental or genetic defect. It was, in fact, that they were runaways, they were incorrigible, and they were sexually active. And so, therefore, they were so far beyond the pale of what was considered to be proper female behavior that they were declared feeble-minded and sent off um, and forcibly sterilized. <clears throat> social workers also made, the other, the other change that social workers brought to this whole dynamic was that they really turned their focus to the illegitimate child. And I use that word in quotes, all right? But it was the language of the day. Um, so they were less focused on the unmarried mother and more focused on the child. So instead of seeing the child as a means by which these women might restore their good name, Social workers came to see mothers as a potential liability to the child's proper future functioning. And although they argued that each individual case required separate evaluation and disposition, these professionals, more often than not, ended up promoting the value of mothers releasing their babies for adoption. Pardon. Now, beginning in 1940, and by 1940, the Salvation Army, it had gone through a series of name changes. By 1940, it was known as Booth Memorial Hospital. It was part of a network of these maternity homes run by the Salvation Army 
named after the founders of the Salvation Army, um, William and Catherine Booth. And in fact, one of the interesting things about the Salvation Army is how thoroughly it interwove women into its leadership ranks, so that in 1934, Evangeline Booth became the first female general of the Salvation Army. So that's, that's who the hospitals were named after. So by the time this photograph was taken, the Salvation Army, <clears throat> Booth Memorial Hospital, and the nation was in the early throes of the post-war baby boom. Yet the pronatalism of the post-war era had defined limits. Babies were to be the products of lawful, moral unions between man and woman. Now, mid-century Americans viewed unwed motherhood as a social, economic, and moral problem demanding intervention for the sake of the baby, the mother, and the community. In a culture that viewed the nuclear family as the nation writ small, the purest embodiment of America's highest ideals, bulwark against communism, engine of economic prosperity, expression of proper morality, the cog that spun the entire national wheel, any disruption of the ideal family became a threat to the very fabric of social life. Good girls were to graduate from high school, marry shortly thereafter, and fulfill their biological, personal, and social destinies by becoming mothers. Many of them did. And many of them did so very happily and very willingly. You know, I'm not disparaging that experience at all. It's just that it was such a pervasive expectation for women, for white women in this period. But these women with their partners, with their husbands, had babies, 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 babies. There were babies everywhere. Hospital nurses and pediatricians' offices, schools, suburbs, station wagons, playgrounds, parks, all were bursting at the seams, teeming with new life. 1957 marked the peak year of the baby boom. <clears throat> it was in 1957 that nearly 12,000 babies were born every day, eight each minute across the country, 4.3 million. Now, what's kind of interesting to note is that in 2007, we beat this mark. Not the, I don't know about the babies per minute, but the absolute number of babies born exceeded this in 2007. The difference was that those babies were born to a greater number of women, so the, small, the families were smaller but we, we did kind of bust this mark. In 1957 though, beds lined the hallways of hospitals overflowing with pregnant women, many of them awaiting the arrival of their third, fourth, even fifth child. Presumably these children had been conceived in love within the parameters of marriage and would occupy their correct roles in a two-parent white picket fence style family. Now, 1957 was also the year that my mother graduated from Spring Lake Park High School. By her own account, she had been a self-conscious young woman, a good student, kind of shy, a little bit reserved. She was quite tall, she was 5'10". <laughs> and so in high school, and particularly in this period, um, where you know, there was a certain kind of image of what, a, you know, what the ideal young woman would be, to be 5'10 and towering over your male classmates did not always make for easy and comfortable socializing in high school. So she didn't date too much in high school. But she was a writer, and so when she graduated from high school, she planned to pursue a journalism degree at the University of Minnesota. So before she had a chance, though, to complete that degree, my mother contributed to the other baby boom. Not all of those babies who were booming around in 1957 or during the baby boom period in general sprang from the bonds of wedded bliss and even good girls like my mom got pregnant outside of marriage. Though their babies contributed to the general boom, they also created an explosion of their own. In 1957, at the boom's peak, the number of children born out of wedlock exceeded 200,000 for the first time in U.S. history, and the illegitimacy rate triple, was triple that of what it had been in 1940. And you can see in the final statistic up here from Minnesota, specifically, from June of 1960 to June of 1961, the rate of births born to unmarried women increased at a dramatically higher rate than the overall birth rate. So what we see and what this tells us is that young people were having sex outside of marriage and contributing to this baby boom despite all the images and the expectations that that was not the way to go. And one solution for these increasing numbers of illegitimately pregnant young women and their offspring was to send them to maternity homes, such as Booth. Now, I want to talk about race here for a minute. 
because most of what I'm talking about here is a decidedly white woman's experience. And that happens for a number of reasons. Um, one scholar, Ricky Solinger, in fact, has argued that race was the single most important factor in determining a young woman's experience of single pregnancy, from how social policy responded to her, to how and where she would wait out her pregnancy, to what she would do with her child, and to how it would affect her life thereafter. Race was the biggest factor in determining those outcomes. And that happened for a number of reasons, one of which was racialized notions of the causes of single pregnancy. So I've already alluded to some of the um, assumptions about what caused these young women to get pregnant outside of marriage. They were feeble-minded, they were socially deviant, they were products of a bad environment, they were victims of men. In the post-war period, we have this rise of psychological explanations for white women's single pregnancy. So white women who got pregnant outside the bonds of marriage were pathologized and were um, labeled as neurotics. They were suffering from some kind of neurotic psychological disorder stemming from a family dysfunction at home that gave them a subconscious desire, right? <laughs> you hear Freud all over here, um, a subconscious desire to get pregnant so that they could either get back at their parents or have something to shower their love on that they weren't getting at home. Now that seems, you know, somewhat harsh in our view now. But the thing about it that seemed a little bit progressive at the time was that that allowed for redemption as well. Because if these young women came into these maternity homes or other kinds of social service agencies and got proper counseling, that proper casework counseling, they could overcome these neuroses and it was even better if they would surrender their babies for adoption, cure themselves through this counseling, and then when they left, they could start their life fresh and clean, fresh start. That was kind of the prevailing assumption about what was leading these young white women to get pregnant. For black women, however, according to Solinger, they were stereotyped as oversexed and promiscuous with little hope for redemption. So many, many professionals just thought, it's not worth our time. That's just what they do. Um, that's a, you know, a gross generalization and, of course, a terribly offensive stereotype. But black mothers, accordingly, thus turned to family and networks within the black community to help them raise their chil children. And that black community was less likely than uh, the white community to cast out the illegitimately pregnant. We also have to think about what's going on in the world of adoption at the time. So the post-war period also sees an increasing number of families formed through adoption, through kind of state-regulated, agency-based, um, non-kin adoption. Adoption had been happening for a long time outside of legal you know, strictures and, and more formal processes. All of those processes became much more formal in the post-war period. <clears throat> Excuse me, and adoption was seen as, quote, the best solution for the population for whom upward mobility was possible. It provided an infertile couple with a child. So I, I just want to think for a minute about the experience of those couples who could not get pregnant because they suffered infertility during this period when family, the nuclear family was so important to American culture. That was not an easy path to travel either. And I know that personally as well, you know, in a different context. Um, so it was gonna, adoption was a way of fulfilling their needs. It also was going to um, be the best solution for the child who would be better off in an intact family, a two-parent family that was financially secure. And it was better for these birth mothers as well because they would go and get counseling surrender their babies for adoption and go off and you know, do their thing and assume their proper roles. The other thing that was happening in adoption during this time was that it was the era of matching. So adoption still wasn't necessarily um, a, a publicly discussed means of forming a family. So many people wanted their children, their adopted children, to look as much as possible like them. And certainly one of the most basic ways to do that is to match your child to you racially. So a lot of these, and, and I'm con, kind of limiting my comments to black women and their children because that's what most of the scholarship has been about. They aren't accounting so much for women of other races except through the lens of forced sterilization. 
Um, so a lot of these black babies who were born and whose mothers may not have been prepared or able to care for them were not able to find homes, um, adoptive homes, because of all of these factors, in addition to which was the fact that some of the maternity homes and these adoption agencies were just blatantly outright racist and segregated and would not deal with black populations. So that is why those are some of the factors contributing to the fact that most of this maternity home experience was, was a white woman's experience. But even for white women, the maternity home experience was the exception to the rule. Only one out of every five or six white unwed mothers went to these 200 maternity homes that were across the country from 1945 to 1965. So most, even white women who got pregnant outside of marriage weren't going to the maternity homes. Many of them got married to shield that illicit pregnancy. Some of them went away to you know, the aunt across the country and dealt with it there privately. They may have arranged private adoptions if they were surrendering their, surrendering their babies for adoption. And some of them were, in fact, raising those children as well. So the increasing incidence of illegitimate pregnancy and birth suggests a gap between the ideal and the reality in terms of at least white women's proper sexual behavior and has been well documented in the scholarly literature. The subject also filled the pages of popular media at the time as well. Stories of women who gave in to temptation or pressure and got pregnant as a result appeared in popular and pulp magazines professional journals, and television news reports. Such stories managed to both titillate audiences with their tales of sexual adventure and to warn girls about the dire consequences thereof. In other words, they perpetuated the conflicting messages about female sexuality that pervaded US culture. Good girls don't, or shouldn't, but want to, and sometimes do. In 1949, for example, we see true confessions up here on the left that published a story about unwed mothers that came with a letter of endorsement from Dr. Leona Baumgartner, who was the associate director of the US Children's Bureau, who praised the magazine's willingness to provide information for and about girls in trouble. True Love magazine, over there on the right, ran a similar article, offering its readers an inside look at the, quote, ever-increasing legion of unloved, unforgiven, unmarried mothers. Who is she, asked reporter Kenneth Eric. Is she criminal or stupid or just an innocent victim? Despite the salacious and offensive tone of some of these articles, their intent was actually to try to shed some sympathetic light on the plight of the unwed mother, despite her antisocial behavior. And you can see in the True Love article up here, you know, it's kind of this plea for help. It could be you. I could be your daughter. I could be your neighbor. So there was, again, some sort of impulse to kind of um, be more sympathetic to these young women who found themselves in trouble. And our local media was similarly attuned to the unwed mother and the institutions whose job it was to serve her, including Booth. On September 25th, 1950, the St. Paul Pioneer Press ran an article entitled Booth Hospital Offers Help, Haven for Unwed Girls, that described the loving care provided by the Salvation Army and noted that about half of the mothers went home with their babies. So we see those numbers going up from the 1920s, for sure. In 1959, the St. Paul Dispatch published a six-part series on girls in trouble, the fifth installment of which focused on Booth. And then, in late 1960, WCCO Television Reports aired a documentary hosted by Dave Moore, whose voice and face I grew up with when I was a kid, watching him on TV. And the documentary was about just simply unwed mothers. It brought television cameras right inside Booth, to showcase the difficulties faced by single pregnant women, as well as the services provided by the Salvation Army. The goal, Moore said, was to enhance viewers' knowledge to reduce the harsh judgment such women often faced in the community. The program pointed out that the young women at Booth were not so unlike young women that viewers might know. Each girl was someone's daughter, someone's neighbor, someone's friend. And don't forget about the parents of these girls, Moore warned for they suffer just as much as the girl herself and don't know how to help her. Thus, entered a place like Booth. Now, during these years, my mother was enjoying a social renaissance at the University of Minnesota. This time, she wasn't quite as good a student as she been in, had been in high school because she was just having a darn good time on campus. She, she had lost weight 
And I say that not because I care about her weight, but because that was a recurring issue for her that she spoke about, she wrote about. It was a really important piece of her self-conception. Um, she had gained confidence, and she had found that college boys had caught up to her in height. Mm -hmm. So she was dating relatively frequently and put her looks to the test in a number of beauty pageants. By 1960, however, she was growing a little bit tired of the college boys and started dating a guy who was a little bit older, a guy named Stan. Stan, um, Stan was my mother's older brother's friend, and they were all part of the Tip Toppers Club, which is a club for tall men and women. I can't remember what the height threshold was, but you know, it's where all those tall people got together and hung out. So Stan was apparently tall. That's all I know about Stan the man at this point. Um, so Stan had also been married and divorced, and he was appealing to my mother because he was just a little bit more mature than some of the boys she was dating at, at the university. But that also meant that you know, he had an expectation for sex. So that was my mother's first sexual encounter, and she got pregnant. Stan, however, was gone. When he was working, he, I think he worked in the construction trade somehow, and he, was, he had a job out of state, and when he found out that my mom was pregnant, he wanted nothing to do with it. So my mother, when, when my sister found my mother, my mother could not, to the end of her life, remember Stan's last name. So that's all we know about Stan. Anyway. So he was not part of anything that came thereafter. So I don't know if during these, this period, if my mother read these articles, if she would have been paying attention to the papers that had these articles about girls in trouble in Booth Memorial Hospital, or if she saw the Dave Moore film on WCCO. I don't know, maybe she had confided in a minister at her church who referred her to Lutheran Social Services, who gave her a brochure about Booth. I don't know specifically how she found out about Booth. But statistically, that avenue is probably the most likely. During 1960, of the 558 young women cared for at Booth, 70% had been referred by social service agencies. In any case, by the time my mother arrived on Booth's doorsteps in January of 1961, Booth was one of 36 maternity homes operated by the Salvation Army across the country, and one of three maternity homes in the Twin Cities. The others were not run by the Salvation Army. There was also a fourth one in Duluth at this time. Now, the Army's goal for <clears throat> its services to these women in this network of maternity homes was, quote, to prevent social ills by improving standards of conduct and living and to serve both mother and child so that each could realize their potentials. While spiritual counsel and religious activities were part of the program for Booth girls, the homes also offered casework counseling, medical and psychiatric care, work therapy, as we see here, and educational and recreational services. So it was that my mother took her place alongside other Booth girls that January, dusting furniture and mopping floors and exchanging stories while waiting to be delivered of their babies. She later wrote a little bit about those days, recalling a hard-edged friend named Jerry who she really liked. Jerry smoked and cracked, there was a smoker <laughs> in Booth at this time. And my mom was writing about Jerry and said, you know, she smoked, she cracked jokes, she was just kind of street tough. And that was something my mother was not, and so she really liked that about Jerry. But then my mother heard Jerry's wails during delivery and saw Jerry's facade crack once her baby had been delivered. <clears throat> now, my mother delivered um, in the middle of the night. She went into labor in the middle of the night, crawling out of her dormitory bed and making her way down the hall to the delivery room. The nurse on duty helped settle her on the bed, then called the doctor. Mom watched the hours tick by on the clock overhead, the nurse reminding her to breathe, not to push. At 5 o'clock in the morning, my mother delivered her baby girl one of 414 such infants delivered at Booth that year. She didn't dare hold that little baby just in case she would lose her resolve to let her go. She named her Lynette, and a couple of days later, signed the papers that signed her baby away. When she relinquished, oh, next. When she relinquished my sister for adoption, my mother stood among the nearly 72% by that time of unmarried mothers served by the Army who did so. Though Army policy was to help each woman determine for herself the best plan for her baby, it insisted that the rights of the child to grow up in the best possible social, economic, moral, spiritual, and, and emotional environment were paramount, and that it would undertake efforts to ensure the well-being 
of the child. And so for many, many people in this post-war United States, the family that met all those criteria was an intact two-parent financially secure family. <clears throat> in the WCCO report, Dave Moore noted that the mothers at Booth who surrendered their babies for adoption, <clears throat> excuse me, did so because they couldn't afford to raise a child, or they were too young, or they were unable or unwilling to assume responsibility for that child. By my mother's own account, factors such as these played a role in her decision to release her baby. She let Lynette go, she would write many years later, so that the baby would not, quote, start life as an illegitimate little person doomed to failure because of me. Besides, she wrote, I didn't want to take on the responsibility either, which made me feel even more worthless than I already did. Still, that she chose not to hold her baby out of fear she wouldn't let go indicates the difficulty with which my mother made that decision. And she later remembered having nightmares and regrets, grief and guilt after leaving Booth and her baby. And she had to, as she wrote later, resist the urge to rush to the Lutheran social service and beg them to give my baby back to me. And she was not alone in her ambivalence over what to do with that child. One of the most interesting sources I found during all of this research was at the University of Minnesota Archives, which houses the Gisela Kanapka Papers. Kanapka was a social work professor at the University of Minnesota who in the early 60s conducted research on adolescent girls in conflict with society's mores. Yeah, it's a mouthful. Um, she, as part of this research, interviewed young women who were in these maternity homes at Booth, at the Catholic Infant Home, and at the Lutheran um, Home for Girls, as well as some girls who were caught up in the juvenile justice system at Sock Center and other places. Um, so in 1963, she and her assistant interviewed 33 Booth girls between the ages of 14 and 19, and those transcripts of those interviews are in the archives at the University of Minnesota. And what's so interesting about them is that they give us a glimpse, however mediated it was, of what these young women were saying and thinking at the time they were at Booth struggling with this decision. These and other interviews became the basis of Kanapka's book that comes out in 1966 called The Adolescent Girl in Conflict. Of the 33 young women that, that Kanapka and her assistant interviewed, 18 of them clearly spoke about having plans to release their babies for adoption. 12 others made it pretty clear that that's what they were planning to, even if they didn't use that specific language. Only three of them had specific plans to keep their babies. Now, we don't know, you know, these were anonymous interviews. We don't know what happened if they actually separated from their babies, if they ended up keeping, we don't know exactly what happened to these 33 girls. But what we do know and what we did hear or could read was what they were thinking about at the time. So one 19-year-old girl echoed my mother's sentiments about sparing her child the stigma of illegitimacy. It was hard for me to give him up, she told the interviewer, but I realized he would have a happy home. Besides, she was the one who had erred. It's better that I bear the grief and the mark instead of the child. It was my mark, not his. And the other thing that's very clear from these interviews is that the decisions were clearly not the girls alone. These girls surrendered their babies at the urging of parents, pastors, social workers, probation officers, adults who wielded considerable influence in the lives of dependent teenagers. The girls that, that Kanapka interviewed were teenagers, right? Some legal age, but um, they really depended on their parents if they had any hope of raising a child on their own. And if they had parents and families who were not happy about this pregnancy and not willing to support that, their daughter and the child, they were kind of out of luck. So when Kanapka publishes her book in 1966, she really rises to the defense of these single pregnant girls. She says that, you know what, they're not feeble-minded, they're not innocent victims, they're not neurotic, it's not a function of dysfunctional families, they were young girls in love. And they were in a relationship. Sometimes, you know, yeah, sometimes they might have been um, schnookered, I'm sure that's not the term she used, by men who pressured them, boyfriends who pressured them into having sex. But they were not these kind of aberrant young women out there. And the other thing she pointed out was that almost all of the girls that she met, not just at Booth, but at these other maternity homes, would have chosen to keep their babies 
if they had had the resources to do so. So she ends up coming out and saying, look, we as a society need to provide some support for these young women. We need to provide daycare centers for women who have to go to work. Or uh, how, how about this? How about grants for young women who want to stay at home and raise their babies? So she was, she was kind of on, on the leading edge of some of these professionals who were talking about unwed mothers. Now, two years after her book came out in 1966, so by 1968, the year I was born, the year my mother became a legitimate mother, Booth was in trouble. Occupancy was declining. From the peak in 1959, when the home department operated above capacity, occupancy had declined to a mere 61% in 1968. And if you think about it, it's the 60s, right? There's a lot of stuff that happens and changes in US culture from 1960 to 1968. That same year, the hospital was functioning at only 31% of capacity. So I should just make clear that Booth Memorial Hospital was a hospital and a residential facility. So girls could deliver their babies. They had the hospital people on staff from the University of Minnesota, but they also lived there for the last few weeks of their pregnancies. By 1968, Booth's finances were also in bad shape, and a study found that its services were out of date and the staff ill-trained. More than anything, though, Booth's end was spelled in the cultural changes that, sur that surrounded it. It had survived the 60s and the sexual revolution and the pill and the fight to legalize abortion, but only barely. And it certainly wasn't the only home or hospital for unwed mothers that met this fate, as you can see in this um, Aunt, Mother's, Aunt, Martha, Aunt Martha's decline there, uh, came out in 1972 in Newsweek magazine. And it's really this article saying, you know, th these maternity homes are falling by the wayside. Aunt Martha isn't needed anymore. These young women, um, thanks to all these liberal changes that have happened over the course of the 60s, are more comfortable admitting that they're having sex and getting pregnant, and they don't feel that same need to, to hide it as they once have. Homes that survived these changes had shifted their focus to postnatal services that helped single mothers support their children. Still others expanded their mission to serve non-pregnant, delinquent, or dependent girls. And that's what Booth did. So by 1971, Booth had outsourced its hospital delivery services to address shortfalls in funding, but that also created a shortfall in income from the hospital patient fees. So in February of that year, it added the Brown House, a group home for young adult women referred by Ramsey County District Court. In June of 1973, the unmarried mother's program at Booth came to an end entirely. Thus, in the year marking its 75th anniversary of its origins of the Salvation Army Rescue Home, Booth Memorial Hospital officially became the Salvation Army Booth Brown House Services. And it currently, oh, there we go, there we go. It currently operates an overnight shelter for young people and housing program that helps disadvantaged youth transition from dependence to independence. And you can see these are the statistics I pulled from Booth Brown's own website on Historic Booth Hospital. So 13,000 plus unwed mothers served there over those years, 75% of whom released their babies for adoption. But what of those one-time Booth girls? Where are they today? How did their time at Booth shape the rest of their lives? How would their recollections some 50 years later compare to the sentiments of Kanaka's interviewees in 1963? Since I, since I couldn't or didn't ask my mother any of these questions, I asked others who had been there. <clears throat> so again, the Minnesota Independent, Scho Independent Scholars Forum got a second legacy grant to support this oral history project last year. I interviewed nine people seven former Booth girls who had been at Booth between 1957 and 1965. Again, a labor and delivery nurse who had worked there from 1966 to 1971, and a Ramsey County caseworker from 1960 to 62. I also interviewed a 10th person, um, a doctor who had, as a medical student at the University of Minnesota, had been at Booth very briefly as a resident. But he wasn't part of the grant project, so he's, his interview is as yet untranscribed. Now these girls, these women, when they were at Booth, ranged in age from 16 to 22 with an average age of 18. And all seven Booth girls relinquished a child born outside of marriage, though several of them also retained custody of other children thus born. All of these interview materials, the transcripts and the interview recordings are now 
archived at the University of Minnesota Social Welfare History Archives. So if this is something you're interested in reading about or even listening to at some point and in some, with some restrictions, they are available at the University of Minnesota. But so here are some of the themes that emerged from these interviews. Booth, the Salvation Army was a Protestant organization, so it attracted Protestant young women to, its, um, to itself. And most of them came from working or from working to upper middle class families, mostly middle class. Many of them described difficult family relationships. Um, what was interesting to me, though, was that many of them talked about difficult relationships with their fathers. And that's interesting because one of the most prominent kind of social work experts back in the late 50s and early 60s was Leontine Young. And she published a book called Unwed Mothers. And in that book, she really hammered home the idea that it was the unwed mother's mother who was to blame, who was the overbearing or aloof or somehow problematic mother that gave her daughter the subconscious need to find and create a, you know, something to love of her own. And you know, she does say, yeah, fathers can play a part in this too, but she really focused on the mothers. The women that I talked to, and granted, seven women is not a representative sample. It's a really small sample. But most of the women I talked to described more difficult relationships with their fathers. Um, one woman said that her father declared her incorrigible when she was out riding around in a car with a bunch of her friends, including her boyfriend. She came home late one night. He called the cops on her, and she was sent to um, some juvenile detention facility. I can't remember which one it was at the moment. Another woman, when she got pregnant, her father had her declared a ward of the state, washed his hands of her. Said, Don't come home. You are not welcome here. The state can take care of you. So, and other, other women talked about fathers who were maybe just incapacitated, but good people. One, one man had a problem with alcohol, so wasn't around a lot, but you know, wasn't unkind. And um, at least one woman described a hard relationship with her mother. She loved her father. Her, she and her father got along famously. Her mother and she clashed. You know what? I have a ch He's not in here. He's out there. I have a 12-year-old right now, so I understand about mother-child <laughs> clashing. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know how out of the ordinary any of this was, and and it didn't necessarily lead to neuroses, right? Which was the point. Um, one of the most pervasive themes that appear in these interviews, as well as in the other literature that has been published about these women, including Anne Fessler's *The Girls Who Went Away*. If you haven't read the book, you're interested in this topic, I highly, highly recommend it, um, is that these young women did not know much about sex, and they certainly didn't have access to birth control. These, the women that I met said, you know, I didn't, I didn't know. Nobody was talking about it. I didn't have a good sex education in school. I wasn't talking to my parents about it. I wasn't even talking to my friends. You know, it was just something that people weren't talking about. So if people weren't talking about it, they certainly weren't, A, planning to have sex, most of them, and thinking ahead enough to get any kind of birth control that was available. And let's remember that the birth control pill wasn't even approved by the FDA until 1960. And even then, it was only available to married women. And even then, it wasn't even available to all married women until the Supreme Court said that it had to be in 1965. So not even all married women could get access to the pill until 1965. It wasn't until 1972 that all women, regardless of marital status, were entitled to have access to the pill. So birth control you know, just was not a factor for most of these women. These women described varied reactions from their parents. Some were supportive, some were not at all supportive, as, as I just mentioned, as well as varied reactions from their boyfriends and partners. So some, like Stan, just said, I don't want anything to do with this. That's not my baby. I don't know what you're talking about. You must be, you know, <laughs> have met other men along the way. Um, some. Boyfriends and partners wanted to get married, and they were ready to stick by that woman and her child. And for various reasons, sometimes including the disapproval of family, you know, parents, they didn't do that. Some did eventually. Um, at any rate, the point is that there were varied reactions. These young men were not all stands, right? Some of them were trying to behave honorably as well. Finally, and the thing I will give you just a few more details about is the fact that most of these women, like those young women who were talking in 1963, felt that they had no choice but to relinquish their babies. 
So Gay had her baby at Booth in 1959. Gay was one of the people who um, spoke most critically about the pressure she felt to surrender her baby for adoption. They got working on me and it worked, it worked. They got my baby. I knew my choice was that I had no choice. Gay was the woman whose father declared her incorrigible, so she wanted to get out of the house. Her older sister had gotten pregnant and got married and got out of the house, so Gay saw that and thought, that's not so bad. You know, it's better than living here. Um, <clears throat> but she and her boyfriend planned to marry and raise that baby. She was 16 or 17 years old at the time. They would have faced you know, considerable challenges in doing that. But she attributes the decision not to marry to the working on her by the social worker, by her probation officer, by other professionals who are advising her on what to do. Pam, Pam is the woman whose father declared her a ward of the state, said do not darken our doorstep again, had her baby at Booth in 1961. She had a little bit different um, story than Gay did. I knew from the outset that I would be giving up my child for adoption. I had no resources or means to keep a child. I was 17 years old, and I just knew that's what I needed to do. <clears throat> it doesn't mean she didn't find it a very, very difficult decision, but she just, she was resolved to, to that being the choice. <clears throat> Sandy B, I interviewed two women named Sandy. This is Sandy number one. She had her first baby at Booth in 1957. She decided to keep him. She, Sandy, was an adopted person herself. She grew up with a mother whom she adored, a kind and loving mother, who unfortunately died when Sandy was 14, leaving her in the care of, as she described him, her cold Norwegian father and his sister, who weren't talking to her about anything at all. And not, I mean, just about the basic, like, how's your day kind of thing according to Sandy. <clears throat> she also talked about, she grew up in a small town in Minnesota, and she talked about, you know, I, nobody was talking about sex and what was right and what was wrong and what to do and not to do and what it even was. She said, um, I, boys in the town started, quote, doing sex things to me when I was 11. So she got to know things, even if she didn't understand what was happening, she, didn't, she wasn't mature enough to understand that this was not right. Nobody was telling her you know, this is not okay, protect yourself. Um, at any rate, she has her first baby in 1957, says, you know, they were trying to push me into adoption, and of course, stubborn me, the more they pushed towards adoption, the more I said, no, I'm gonna keep them. And she did, her son named John. So she had a hard time. You know, she was, she was not a teenager, I can't remember how old she was, in her 20s at this time. And she did raise her child, she's, they roomed in a house with a family for a while who helped take care of that baby while she worked. I think for a while, another family took care of that baby so that she could work. And then she got pregnant again, also outside of marriage. And that baby, she didn't have that baby at Booth, that daughter, but she surrendered that daughter for adoption. And she said, I did it because I knew how hard it was to raise this child as a single parent. So there's not one easy answer or one clear story in this whole history here. And then finally, Gail had her baby at Booth in 1964. Gail, um, great relationship with her father, not so great with her mother, and knew, <laughs> she really enjoyed her time at Booth, actually. She had a lot of conflict with her mother. And so when she got pregnant, um, actually when she got pregnant, her father drove her to Colorado because they had a connection to a doctor in Colorado that they thought would do an abortion. So they, her father drives her to Colorado. By the time they get out there, though, the doctor refuses to do it because he's been under surveillance by you know, legal authorities, whoever they were. And so he wasn't willing to risk his practice to do this. So they came home, made arrangements for Gail to go to Booth, and she loved it. She said, I was happy to get out of my mother's range. And she was a reader. She said, I just holed up at Booth and I read, and I had time to myself, and it was fine. So she didn't have a bad experience at Booth. And she knew that she wasn't gonna keep that baby. She, um, as she expresses here, you know, I didn't wanna keep that child. I had other plans. So it seems like a lot of the girls were conflicted there and I don't remember being conflicted. My mother was. Her mother wanted to keep and raise that baby. But Gail probably fits that image of, you know, this young white woman on a path towards college education. Her father was a professor. She was, she was heading down that path herself, and she was looking for a chance to do that. 
and raising a child by herself was going to interfere with that. Now, that doesn't mean that Gail made that decision lightly. And it doesn't mean that she didn't spend the next many, many years in therapy to try to deal with. In her view, it wasn't so much the pregnancy and the surrender as it was the silence and the shame that surrounded this whole experience of her pregnancy that led her to seek therapy years later. All but one of the seven Booth girls that I interviewed reunited with their adopted away children, sometimes smoothly and happily, other times uneasily and painfully. Fortunately for all of us and my family, my mother's reunion with her first daughter went well. They had a good, if not extraordinarily close, relationship for 15 years. My sister, who had been raised as an only child, saw herself reflected in my mother, my aunts and uncles, my brother. She looks like my brother, um, blonde hair, blue eyes. She also gained two siblings, and while we may not be all that she had hoped for, she and I still have a relationship. She lives outside of Detroit with her family. For her part, my mother could lay to rest some of the questions and concerns she'd had about her lost daughter for all those years. She could release the burden of silence that she'd carried for more than three decades and, hopefully, integrate her before Booth and after Booth lives. Kim came into our lives the same year my father, who had Parkinson's disease, went into a nursing home because it was too hard for my mother to take care of him at home anymore. He was there for 18 months and died in March of 1996. My mother returned to the University of Minnesota soon thereafter to complete the degree that had been interrupted by that pregnancy so many years ago. Instead of journalism, though, she earned a bachelor's degree in English and creative writing. She'd always been a writer, degree or no, but after Kim came back, she started writing about her experiences as a shamed unwed mother in 1960 and 1961. I cherish Kim's presence in my life, she wrote in one essay, even though it has forced me to let go of some long-held illusions about who I really am. Silence and secrecy take a toll. My reticence is rooted deep and tangled and strong. And just when I think I have weeded out my fear enough to confide in someone, a green tendril of doubt shoots up to remind me of who I am and what I have done and what I have too often left undone. So for me, what, you know, I started this project because I wanted to answer some really personal questions for myself and about myself, but also about my mother. So I have to believe that it was Kim's return to my mother's life that opened her heart to my son in a way that she may not have been able to otherwise. She had been reunited with her first daughter for 12 years before a little boy born halfway across the world came into our family. She absorbed him with grace and love. Now, knowing my mother's story and those of the other Booth girls I met makes me wonder about my son's Vietnam mama. It makes me wonder how circumscribed her choices were. It reminds me that, though she has not seen him for nearly 13 years, he is certainly still part of her. It makes me uncomfortable to know that we have benefited so greatly from another woman's great loss. And it reminds me that, at best, adoption is an imperfect solution to a difficult situation. At worst, it is a systematic denial of a woman's or a man's, we haven't talked about the men at all in this whole story, right to mother. I hope that we as a culture have learned that while love may not be enough to overcome the odds against which some parenting situations are stacked, it is the foundation on which a viable scaffold of social, political, and cultural support ought to be erected. Thank you so much for coming. Thank mm -hmm. you.